So many people have asked me why now? Why are we undertaking a plan for downtown? It's, it's a number of things. Uh, we completed a, a fantastic Super Bowl and people were really excited about the energy that went on downtown. There have been a number of changes in partnering organizations that IDI works with, a number of leadership changes. The city traditionally completes a regional center plan and that was completed about 10 years ago. So th there, was, there was a number of things going on when I started this, this position and it felt like a critical yet oppor opportunistic time to really launch a discussion and plan for downtown. And a lot of people say, well, what do you consider downtown? So uh, do you think about it as the central business district, the area that you can walk uh, to different places in and around downtown? Is it regional center, which is uh, the downtown that's uh, bounded by the interstates and the river? And that's generally what IDI considers downtown. Or if you ask the number of folks that live beyond those boundaries, uh, those residents would say, I live downtown. So I think downtown means uh, different things to different people. We've really concentrated this initial discussion on uh, that central business district and regional center. But as many of you uh, that do know me, I've been a community developer all of my life. And so I find a strength in neighborhoods. And so it's very important to also think about the neighborhoods that surround uh, the regional um, center district or what we consider downtown and the strength that downtown gets from those neighborhoods. Uh, you know, we have so many cultural uh, opportunities and amenities downtown that the residents support, along with a lot of our retail restaurants. And a lot of the neighborhoods benefit from the vitality that uh, downtown creates. So, um, you know, keep that in mind as you undertake this exercise that we will um, get about uh, shortly. You'll see green uh, dots on your um, chairs, do not throw those away because you'll learn more about those and you'll want to have more than what you're sitting on. So uh, with that, I want to go ahead and ask Krista Skidmore, who is uh, our chair for um, this Velocity undertaking to come up. But before she um, gets up on stage, I want to do a couple of thank yous. I want to thank the Arts Council for helping us get this terrific space for this evening. That's all right. I want to thank uh, Sun King for being a tremendous sponsor uh, for this event. They are just a wonderful community partner. And I want to thank the City of Indianapolis and the partnering organizations that have agreed to participate. You've all been great, wonderful partners, so thank you. the best chairperson that anyone could ask for. She's an IDI board member, but she has put in more time and energy into this process, and it is far uh, better for all of her work and efforts. So, Krista? Thank you. Thanks. So thank you. Back to you, Sherry, and to the IDI board of directors uh, for, most importantly, making this significant investment uh, in this initiative. We wouldn't be here today without uh, the leadership and support of Sherry. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the entire Indianapolis Downtown Inc. team who've really gone above and beyond in so many different ways, uh, thousands of ways really, and to Molly Williams and, and Bob Schultz in particular who have helped to organize uh, this launch event today. I'd uh, also be remiss if I didn't thank the fabulous Kristen Hess. Uh, who is our Velocity project manager who's on loan to us from Indiana Humanities. Uh, and she has breathed so much life and enthusiasm into this project and we're so grateful to her uh, efforts as well. <laughs> Finally, I want to thank our steering committee and our advisory group chairs. Uh, along with me, each of these individuals have very busy schedules and have uh, agreed to dedicate some of their volunteer time to make this project more successful. I'd love for each of you to stand and be recognized now. Thanks. So we've formed Velocity's leadership as well as the process itself um, to take into account uh, being representative of the full set of diversity in every sense of that word uh, that our community has. 
Um, we, for me personally, I've uh, chosen to live in downtown. Um, I've chosen to headquarter my business in downtown. Uh, and I know um, I'm not alone in my passion and love for making our downtown uh, one of the best. As I look out into the room today, um, I'm really struck by the talent and commitment represented here. Uh, each of you spend so much time making this a great place to live, work, and play. I'm so thankful for all of your efforts. I'm, uh, I'm reminded of the uh, aphorism, what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. And when I think about uh, what we've achieved here, we certainly have a lot to be proud of, don't we? Uh, yes. A lot of great leaders have come before us and helped to take us to where we are today. Uh, but I think we also all agree that there's still work yet to be done. And um, let's talk a little bit about what the velocity process is and what's to come. So today we've done some preparation work. Uh, we've begun prioritization of the process. We're working with a lot of subject matter experts across, lined up really behind six advisory groups. Uh, these six advisory groups, I'm going to read off to you because collectively, when we look at each of these six together, they represent the elements of a vibrant downtown. So vibrant economic development, public spaces and activation, multimodal transportation solutions, downtown environment and experience, housing, neighborhoods and livability, and arts, culture, and attractions. So today, we're going to share with you some of the general themes that have emerged so far, but we're seeking your initial reactions and input and validation. Uh, we are in the ideation phase still, and um, there are a number of ways that you can help. One of those is to complete the velocity survey. So on your chairs, in addition to the dots that we'll use later that Sherry talked about, we, um, we have a postcard that shows you those six elements of the strategic plan and references an online survey at indievelocity.com. Uh, in 24 hours, we had over 200 responses so far, so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, our friends at Puma, who, for, who you'll hear from later, have told us that the record for survey completion is 5,000 in any of the cities they've worked with across 34 states. So can you guess what number I want to be at? At least 5,001, right? So nothing is worse than being a part of any strategic planning initiative and having that plan sit on the shelf and gather dust. And we've worked very hard to structure velocity differently. So first we've created what we think is one of the first repositories of downtown existing planning and strategic plan documents. So we aren't reinventing the wheel, rather we're building on all of the great work that's been done, uh, as well as previous, previous efforts, but also uh, efforts that are ongoing right now. Secondly, the plan is uh, structured so that collaborating organizations are coming together to help us to activate pieces of this plan. This not only will help us with successful outcomes, but ready us for immediate implementation and execution. Uh, particularly, the process is going to identify some low-hanging fruit, some quick wins, as it were, that we can get started on right away. In terms of timeline, the uh, plan draft will be completed in the September-October time frame, and that's when we'll begin the, the rollout process. So finally, we're not just thinking about downtown, as it's connected to neighborhoods, as it's connected to the region as a whole and to our state. But we're also thinking very broadly uh, by examining what's happening in peer cities across the country. Uh, we believe this is a, a great process that's going to help us to understand how to differentiate uh, ourselves in terms of how we can attract and retain not only jobs, but talent, as well as attract visitors, conventions, uh, and, and residents to the downtown area. So our speaker today is going to help us get kicked off uh, by inspiring us to think broadly about what it means to be a world-class city. So Lee Fisher was selected as president and CEO of CEOs for Cities in May of 2011. He has opened 
CEO cities across the country. Lee has served um, on the Ohio State Legislature, the Ohio Attorney General, President and CEO of Cleveland Center for Families and Children, and was Ohio's Lieutenant Governor. During the time Lee led Ohio's economic development efforts, Site Selection Magazine awarded Ohio, Ohio with the 2008 Competitiveness Award. Please help me welcome Lee Fisher for economic development. So in many ways, Lee's been where we're going right now. And um, a special thanks to Brian Payne of CICF and the Indianapolis Cluster of CEOs for Cities for coordinating uh, Lee's visit with us here in Indianapolis today. Please help me welcome Lee Fisher. Krista, thank you very much. Krista was the first person who reached out to me and has been wonderful to work with. My friend Brian Payne was the person who introduced me to Krista. Uh, and there are a couple people I want to thank before I tell you a little story about why getting here was not quite as easy as you might have expected. But first, I want to say to thank you to Sherry Seiwert for your outstanding leadership, not just now, but over many years. Uh, to Molly Williams, who's been phenomenal. Uh, and if I had listened to Molly, by the way, I wouldn't have got into much, as much trouble as I did just an hour ago. You'll understand what I mean in a minute. Uh, to Kira Amstutz, who uh, I've worked with uh, in the Indianapolis cluster and has been a vital part of Velocity. Uh, and to Bill Taft, uh, who's also been a big part of our cluster and has been a vital part of Velocity. Now let me tell you the story. Uh, Molly Williams and Krista gave me all the details, but I sometimes don't focus until just about an hour before I'm about to go somewhere or to give a speech. And so it just so happens that our organization is having its national meeting this year in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and we're all staying at the JW Marriott. So at 3 o'clock, I arrived today, I arrived at the JW Marriott. And I said, I'm here to speak to a downtown group uh, about Velocity. Now, you would think that the people at the front desk of the JW Marriott would have said, we don't know what you're talking about. They said, up the escalator and to the right. <laughs> now you see where I'm going? So I go upstairs, and sure enough, there's a large crowd. And I'm looking for Kira or... Brian Payne, somebody that I know, but I'll be honest with you, they had a spread of food that was phenomenal. <laughs> and I was starved, so I really focused just on eating. And I noticed that a couple of people were looking at me, and I, I couldn't tell what. And a woman comes up to me and says, who are you? And I said, well, I'm Lee Fisher, and I'm going to be uh, speaking uh, probably in about 30 minutes. And I could tell she was confused. But I saw her go back and talk to a couple of people. She comes back about five minutes later and says, Sir, I don't know how to tell you this, but we don't know who you are. We've never heard of you, and you're not speaking today. <laughs> well, you have to understand that I was in government and politics in Ohio for 20 years. And I lear if I learned anything, you take advantage of every opportunity. So just about 45 minutes ago, I gave the keynote address to the Indianapolis Pesticide Association. <laughs> and I talked about velocity, and somehow they related. Now, so after that, I realize I'm in the wrong place, right? So I call uh, Brian Payne, I said, Brian, can you get me over to the Arts Council because that's where I have to go. So sure enough, Brian sends someone from the foundation and drops me off at the Arts Council. And I walk in and I said, I'm here to give the speech. And they said, this is not where you think you're supposed to be going. The Arts Council and the Arts Garden are not the same thing. So thank God for Dave Lawrence, who just luckily was coming here. And Dave gave me my second ride of the day to the Arts Garden. So I want you to know the journey to Indianapolis was easy, but the journey to the place we are today, the Arts Garden, was not so easy. And I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, what I want to talk to you about today is what I'm seeing around the country. Uh, and I want to begin by telling you something that maybe you already know, but maybe you don't. 
Indianapolis is a model for many American cities. And I find that when I go to cities around the country, sometimes they don't realize how others view them. But I can tell you that all around the country, there are just more, no more than five or six cities that come up in conversations as I travel. And when you're looking for a walkable and connected city, guess is one of the cities that's mentioned in the top five? Indianapolis. When you're talking about a city that has captured something that is special, like, for example, arts and culture and sports, guess what? Indianapolis is mentioned. And when you're talking about steakhouses, <laughs> Indianapolis is the only city mentioned, St. Elmo's. So that's not in my slides. I thought I'd just mention that. Uh, hopefully you can see this. I realize that with these great windows, it may be a challenge for some of you. Uh, but I believe that if you want, does this work? Yeah, OK. If you want to change the world, then you start with your city. Why do I say that? Well, with all due respect to the men and women who serve our country in the United States Senate and the United States Congress, and there are many good men and women in both parties who do, I was moderating a panel at the Clinton Global Initiative last year, and I was sitting next to the president of Iceland. And he said something that I will never forget. He said, the problem with you Americans is that you spend too much time waiting for Washington. And he's right. Washington, unfortunately, has become a dysfunctional place in recent years. And the prospects for it becoming functional in future years is not so good. So if there was ever a time for change from the bottom up, focusing on what many believe to be the last refuge of functional government cities, now's the time. From the beginning of time, until about the year 1800, there were one billion people on Earth. But from 1800, just until October 31st of 2011, we exploded to seven billion people. And to put it in perspective, more than seven billion people on Earth today, and the sixth billion person on Earth is about 13 years old. That gives you an idea of how fast we're moving. But where are all these people living? Imagine yourself coming in to Earth from out of space. And you look at Earth and you see something very interesting. You see these vast stretches of water and these vast stretches of desert and land. But it only until you get much closer to Earth do you start seeing lights. And these lights are huddled together in places called cities. Today in America, there are 243 million Americans living on just 3% of the land. And that's our cities. And when people huddle together, then Great innovation occurs, great ideas occur. Today, 65 million people every year on our planet are moving to cities. That's equivalent to about seven Chicago's every single year. And what's happening in those cities? Innovation. 75% of our gross domestic product, and worldwide it's even larger, is coming from our cities. So what do we do at Seals for Cities? We curate smart ideas and practices and stories. We connect CEOs and change makers and what we call city disruptors. People who don't wait for permission to make change, they just go do it. And we catalyze collaborative change for city progress and success. I would argue that this in many ways describes the Velocity Plan. There's a book out by a Harvard professor by the name of Ed Glazer, and he wrote it. It's called The Triumph of the City, and he says in that book, Knowledge is more valuable than ever, and that has increased the value of learning from people in other cities. So we begin as CEOs for Cities saying that if you want to belong to our organization, you have to be humble. You have to recognize that no matter how much talent you have in Indianapolis, or Philadelphia, or San Francisco, that there's always something to learn from someone else somewhere else. And what we do is bring cities together, both virtually and physically, to share those best ideas. So we do research, we do storytelling, we do uh, the kind of research that helps determine how to make a city successful. We have national events, and we have a program we call City Dividends, I'll talk about it in a minute, prize competitions, those kinds of things. If you change the way that you look at something, 
the thing that it, you look at changes. So it begins by looking at your city in a new way. That's not easy to do, especially if you've lived here a long time or if you grew up. But if you truly want to transform your city, start looking at it as if you're just coming to Indianapolis for the very first time. My father-in-law was a prisoner of war in World War II, and we often wondered how he survived when younger men and stronger men and smarter men did not. And one day, after, many years after he had been liberated, my mother-in-law pulled out of the closet the diary that he had kept as a prisoner of war. Two things stood out from this diary. Today it's in a museum in my hometown of Cleveland, Ohio. And the first were the nine children he would someday raise. He had only been married 90 days before. Uh, but because he had something to do with it, he was a pretty good predictor of the number of children he would have and what their names would be. But more interesting was this. Mike Zone, my father-in-law, loved to eat, but had no idea how to cook. But every page was full of recipes. Pasta, everything you can imagine, cottage cheese. Years later, when he was finally back home, my mother-in-law, especially with regard to the pasta and the sauce, used the recipes almost to a T. But when he got back home, he couldn't put anything together. So how did he survive? He survived because he could do something that many of the other men could not. He could see beyond the cruelty of the guards. He could see beyond the barbed wire. He could see his future. In fact, in his case, he could taste it. And when I served as the attorney general of my state, and I met young men and women who had no sense of their future. For them, prison was a land beyond pain. And I've come to believe over the years, after having also served as the president of a large organization called the Center for Families and Children, that the greatest gift you can give a child, the greatest gift you can give a human being, the greatest gift you can give a country, a state, or yes, a city, is the ability to see its own future. That's what keeps people moving every single day. Now, there's no question that our cities have problems. We have poverty that must be addressed. We have traffic congestion. We have pollution that must be addressed. But we believe you don't ignore those problems, but you focus on unearthing your potential and investing in your assets. Now, for those of you who can't read this cartoon, let me just read it to you. There's a mother pigeon talking to her baby pigeons and there's a man beneath on a bench and the caption reads today's lesson is about targets of opportunity you have a target of opportunity here and you're taking full advantage of it with velocity and as a result more and more people around the world are looking at cities like Indianapolis like this smarter cities more livable cities vibrant cities sustainable cities Cities that actually can transform not just the city, but can transform the neighborhoods, can transform the region, because it all begins with the core. So we think you should think as a startup, and think about it. What are the oldest institutions on earth? Even great companies come and go, but great cities stay. They don't always stay great, but they're always there. So it's hard to think like a startup, but if you think like a startup, you will succeed and be competitive in this next century. Now think about all the information generated from the beginning of time until about the year 2003. That's a lot of information. Think about that. All the information on Earth. Eric Schmidt of Google and his team at Google calculated that that same amount of information is now produced literally every two days on Earth between Monday and Wednesday. We're replicating the amount of information during all those centuries every 48 hours. So when you titled your plan Velocity, you were onto something. Because the truth is, you've got to act fast. Because the truth is that other cities are doing what you're doing. You have to do it better, and you have to do it faster. And I'll explain why in a minute. So when Tom Friedman wrote his iconic book in the year 2005, The World is Flat, it's amazing to me that many people believe that 2005 was the old days. Not the 1950s or the 60s or the 70s, 2005. Why? Because six years ago, Facebook didn't exist. Twitter was a sound. The cloud was in the sky. 4G was a parking place. And LinkedIn was a prison. 
And that was just in 2005. We send over 8 billion text messages a day. Think about that. There are 7 billion people on Earth, right? And we're sending more text messages before we go to bed tonight than there are people on Earth. But here is something that even the smartest people in the room, like Krista, do not know. Krista, are you texting right now? Okay. Oh, okay. I, I, it's ironic. I'm looking at Krista, and there she is texting. Okay. Uh, now think about this. 42% 42, 42 of the text messages sent around the world are sent by one person, my daughter, Jessica. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. I swear to you, I was given a speech once about this, and she texted me right at that moment. Any of you who are parents of somebody who is under the age 30, you get this. Now, our son is a little older, graduated from Syracuse University a few years ago, and my wife Peggy and I sat Jason down, and we did like all parents do, and we say, okay, Jason, what do you want to do now with your life? You've now graduated. You've got your college diploma. And Jason said something to Peggy and me that I never would have said to my mom and dad in a thousand years, but I have to say my son is not unique. He's actually typical of his generation. What did he say? He said, Dad, Mom, what I want to do hasn't been invented yet. It's a whole new way of thinking. And those were his exact words. That's the way this generation thinks. And that's the way you should think if you want to truly transform Indianapolis. Wayne Gretzky, the great Hall of Fame hockey player, was, what asked, was once asked, what makes you this great Hall of Fame hockey player? And he just humbly said, hey, I just learned how to skate where the puck was going, not where the puck was. And that's what velocity is all about. Now, your strategic plan that you're about to write this year, the sell-by date is coming up already. Meaning that although I know you want a strategic plan that is three years or five years, and that's good, and that's a good idea, just recognize that the most important thing in that plan must be the word flexibility. Because I just showed you that things change. Ask Kodak, ask MySpace, ask Blockbuster if things don't change real fast. So we do research on what makes cities successful. And you, your six areas fit perfectly with our four areas. We just happen to have four because I like to spell out words so people remember. So they spell out city. We say that if you're a city that's connected, innovative, talented, and that you invest in your distinctive assets, you will transform your city. So let's talk about that just for a moment. In a sense, what we do is a set of metrics that helps you guide your progress. How are we doing? Not necessarily against other cities, but against our own metrics. And we look at all sorts of things. We look at voting patterns. We look at community involvement, economic integration, transit use, walkability, international students, foreign travel, just to get a sense of how a city connects its physical capital with its social capital, with its human capital, and even with its digital capital. And when Tom Friedman wrote his book, the world is flat, all of a sudden all these smart people around the world said distance is dead. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter where you work. Well, just the opposite is true. It's called the location paradox. As the world gets flatter, where you live actually becomes more important, not less. And so that's why cities have become so important. Now, Forbes recently did a list of 15 U.S. cities emerging downtowns. And although <clears throat> Indianapolis is not on the list, to be honest with you, that's irrelevant. Because the truth of the matter is they didn't really look at every downtown. But I can tell you this, based upon what I've seen here and what I've seen in this plan, that would, if it said the top five U.S. city emerging downtowns, Indianapolis would be in the list, at least my list. So let's talk about what some other cities are doing just to give you a flavor, and we'll start with my hometown. Now, Cleveland, much more so than Indianapolis, has been the butt of jokes for many, many years, as you well know. But if you go to Cleveland, uh-uh, no more. It's not just because we have the Rock and Roll Hall, the Fame Museum, it's because we're finally figuring out that we are right next to the greatest body, the largest body of fresh water in the world called the Great Lakes. And we're finally connecting, after all these centuries, our water to our city. And many cities still struggle with that today, even with your phenomenal canal. And so we also <clears throat> are, have free trolley service just about 
seven days a week, almost day and night. We have a little boat out on the lakefront. It's a business, and they do their business on the lakefront in a boat. It's called Lean Dog, because they're trying to make the point that you've got to bring the city to the water and the water to the city. We have something called the Health Line, which is a bus rapid transit system that connects our two major anchors of downtown Cleveland and University Circle. Let's go to Philadelphia. <clears throat> Anybody who knows anything about downtowns know that before you can talk about vibrancy, before you can talk about livability, there are two things that are the predicates. They're the ticket of admission to the game. Your downtown has to be clean and it has to be safe. Because no matter how much you do, the game changers are the things you're doing in your plan. <clears throat> but the ticket of admission is being clean and safe, and Philadelphia gets that. And so they have right now 128 people whose only job is to clean and to sweep and to serve the people of Philadelphia downtown. They've seen a dramatic 16% population increase. And what's most interesting is that in every city in America, there are young and restless between the ages of, oh, let's say 24 and 35 moving to the cities. But many of them, when they have children, they move back out to the suburbs, not in Philadelphia. Because they're recognizing that they have to cater not just to the young and the restless, but the young and the restless with children. In other words, think of your downtown not just as the living room, but as the family room as well. Pittsburgh, they're in called Pop-Up, where he basically gives out grants for areas of the city that have long been vacant to give grants for people to actually literally pop up stores, pop up businesses. And because they do it so rapidly, all of a sudden areas are coming to life. Or in St. Paul, like you, they have a great arts and culture tradition. And they take full advantage of it with 52,000 theater seats, and they call themselves the city of neighborhoods because they recognize, as Sherry said, that you really can't divide and separate your downtown from your neighborhoods. Your neighborhoods need downtown, and downtown needs neighborhoods, and one of the cities that does it best is St. Paul. Or next door, Minneapolis, 37 miles of bike lanes on the streets, becoming one of the bike capitals in the United States. And here's something interesting. Minneapolis is one of the few cities I've gone to that recognizes that trying to deal with the issue of poverty is just as important as trying to deal with the issue of vibrancy. And so what the mayor has done is he's literally created right in the center of downtown a building on an each floor is a different stage of homelessness from the people who are most desperate to the people who are eventually getting to be independent. And more than 300 people have come off the streets and they recycle. And it's a phenomenal thing that he's done. And hopefully, the Higher Ground Project will be replicated by cities around the country. Where we're having our national meeting this year, Grand Rapids, people say to me, why are you having your national meeting in Grand Rapids, Michigan? Because we've had it in Boston and Chicago and Portland. I said, I'll tell you why. Because I want to send a message that you don't have to be a large city to be a great city. And right now, Grand Rapids has become a great city. It has the largest art prize competition in the world. Thousands of people from all over the world in late September and early October descend upon Grand Rapids. And here's what's unique about this arts competition. The winners are determined by the people who are at the arts competition, the citizens. No, no fancy judges. Anybody who wants to fly in from any part of the world and come to Grand Rapids during that gets to register and they get a vote. Uh, and you see art everywhere, outside, inside, upside down, everywhere. It's an exciting place to be, and so we're holding our national meeting during Arts Prize. And they have many grant programs like Pittsburgh that encourage pop-ups. Now, Detroit. This is the city that is probably most talked about in the world today, or at least in the United States. A city that has seen its share of struggles. But you need to know that if you spend some time in Detroit, Despite its substantial challenges, it's actually one of the most exciting cities in the country. Dan Gilbert, the CEO of Quicken Loans, has literally invested a billion dollars from his company in revitalizing downtown. He purchased 22 buildings in downtown Detroit. He's revitalizing every single one. He's put together incubators where he's giving grants, incentive grants to startups to come downtown. And all of a sudden, downtown Detroit is coming alive. 
and they have got a new plan called Detroit Future City, funded by the Kresge Foundation, and Dan Gilbert's plan is called Opportunity Detroit, and I will tell you that within the next three to five years, you won't recognize Detroit all for the better. New Orleans, we know already that's the festival capital of the world, but because people were resilient after Katrina, it's also becoming one of the great startup cities in the world as well. Atlanta, where they focus on little things like making sure that they're plants, that they call it downtown Atlantis in bloom. They focus on making sure that every day people can see flowers, people can see plants. It may seem silly, but it's not. Because how people feel when they walk down your streets determines whether or not they want to live there, stay there, or come back there. Or Des Moines, another city that you wouldn't necessarily think is in the top 15 or even 20 downtowns, but it is. They are literally have taken a, built a nonprofit corporation, and they are literally buying land and so that they control it, and then working with developers to redevelop it. Because they want to get control of all this land so someone doesn't take, take it who's not going to be dedicated to the success of Des Moines. St. Louis, same thing, taking advantage of entrepreneurship, taking, doing something like the High Line in New York City, bicycle stations everywhere, or San Jose, where they have people who walk all downtown called uh, Green Ambassadors, just helping people find their way. Or Los Angeles, which has taken a city that is truly spread out, far too spread out in many ways, but in its downtown, also focusing on arts and culture, much like you have. In Denver, same thing. Here in Cincinnati, Ohio, this was the highest crime area in the country. And because of the use of historic preservation tax credits, it's now been literally transformed into one of the most vibrant neighborhoods in the United States today. In Cleveland, a little street, not any longer than from this stage to that back wall is now the busiest place in Cleveland. You can't move every day, or I should say every night, and not just Friday and Saturday, every night. Because the truth is, density is what's matter. You, ne you can't necessarily do everything you want in all of downtown, but if you can at least do something in the core of the core, determine where that is and bring density, magic happens. Oklahoma City, they used the sales tax, dedicated to one thing and one thing only, making their downtown more livable, and the people were willing to pay for it. I've already mentioned the health line in Cleveland. Washington, D.C. has the largest bike sharing program in the country. Here's an interesting thing in Grand Rapids. Five big companies came together who don't compete. Wolverine Shoes, Myers Groceries, Amway, Steelcase Furniture, and they said, we're going to select some of our best and brightest employees, and we're all going to go into one building and share space. And what's happening? They all actually have something in common. Even though they don't compete with each other, <clears throat> they're all interested in one thing. It's called innovation. And so what's happened is grocery stores are helping furniture stores. Furniture stores are helping Amway. And it's the new kind of sharing economy that's going to be popping up all around the country, and there's no reason it couldn't happen here in Indianapolis. We have a digital engagement, civic, a digital civic engagement platform we call Change by Us to make it easier for citizens using technology to, to work with their mayors and their city halls, like Mayor Ballard, uh, and to work with each other to do projects. And we also look at other things, too. Now, most of my time I've spent here today is making your city more connected, but you also need to make it more innovative as well. So we look at the number of patents, venture capital, self-employment, small business, all those kinds of things. And we try to cluster people together in cities where magic can happen. Here's my definition of a cluster. A cluster is where if you lose your job, you do not lose your parking place because you can go next door and get a job because of the clusters of activities that you see in places like the Research Triangle or the Silicon Valley or even in Ohio in a place called the Ohio Hubs of Innovation and Opportunity. There are places like Mass Challenge in Boston, one of the largest startup accelerators in the country, uh, organizations like Jumpstart that are investing in small businesses. Uh, in Philadelphia, the mayor 
has off opened up an office called Neurourban Mechanics. Basically, he said he's given some of his best and brightest staff a pool of money and said, go fail. Go do things interesting that will help our city. And if you fail, that's all right. That's unheard of in politics and government. But this is the new wave, and it's happening in Boston, Philadelphia, many other cities. And then we look at talent. How do you develop your talent? How do you retain and attract your talent? So we look at college attainment, creative professionals, the young and restless, traded sector talent, international talent, all these things. And it all comes down to this. Young adults are moving to cities. Our research called the young and restless shows that the number of college educated 25 to 34 year olds are growing twice as fast in close in urban neighborhoods. We are a nation that slowly but surely is moving from drivable suburbanism to walkable urbanism. And so we also look at how you focus on being you, your distinctive, authentic self. We call it your weirdness factor. And in this case, the weirder you are, the better. So Cleveland, unfortunately, is not doing so well in the weird category. We're the least weird city in the country. And I told my friends in Cleveland, it's going to take us a while to become weird. So let's just say we're the most normal city in America and be proud of it. Uh, but my point is, we look at the things, whether it's restaurants, how well you do in festivals, all those kinds of things, like, for example, South by Southwest in Austin, how well Milwaukee takes advantage of being by the fresh, uh, the fresh lakes. But whatever you do, it's saying to people, we're authentic, and we have found our distinctive soul. So I'd love it if you would live in my downtown, Indianapolis. I think, and I, it's not just me, there's a Harvard professor who wrote a book called The Progress Principle, that the single greatest motivator of human behavior. This plan that you are putting together, if you are told that your problems will be solved, all of you will be skeptical and for good reason. But if over the coming months and years you can see the thermometer move and you can see progress, that's what will keep your momentum going. So make sure you have some short-term goals so you can have some short-term wins, not just long-term goals, because that doesn't sustain momentum. So at CEOs for Cities, we've developed these things called dividends. We have a talent dividend, a green dividend, an opportunity dividend. And what do I mean by that? Think about this. If you increased the number of people in this country who have a two-year or four-year degree by just 1%, not 10%, 1%. You would literally lift the average earnings or the per capita income of America by 143 billion, with a B, dollars every single year. Or what if you reduced <coughs> the number of miles people are in their car? In other words, you reduce by just one mile per day over the course of a year the amount of time people spend in their car. The economic savings for America on buying cars, buying gas, repairing cars, fixing potholes, $31 billion. Or what if we reduce poverty by 1%? Perhaps the greatest single issue facing America today. We've heard about the war on poverty, and no one believed we could solve it. But everyone believes we can make progress in it. So if we reduce poverty by 1%, our calculation is that America would save about $31 billion in government programs dedicated to poverty programs today. By the year 2018, 63% of jobs will require some form of college education. And get this, this is the key. If you get, a, if you get more people in Indianapolis with a two-year degree and a four-year degree, it doesn't just help the people getting the degree. It helps everyone. The research shows that when a region increases its educational attainment rate by 10%, everybody in the region's salaries go up by 7%, including people including people, not salaries, per capita income, goes up by 7%, including people without even a high school degree. It's a rising tide that lifts all boats. Your neighbor's education, in a sense, determines your salary. That's how powerful this is. 58% of a city's success comes down to just one thing, if you measure that city's success by per capita income. And that's how many people you graduate with two-year and four-year degrees and then keep in your city. So if we did it in Indianapolis, we've done the calculation. If you were to increase the number of people in Indianapolis and the surrounding region who have a two-year and a four-year degree by just 
you would literally increase the per capita income of the Indianapolis region every single year, $1.5 billion. And we also believe that sometimes having a prize helps. So we were lucky, the Kresge Foundation gave us a million dollars and now we have 57 cities around the country competing to see who can increase their college attainment rate the fastest. And cities all over America are developing programs just for that purpose. Or, as I said on the green dividend, how much would we save if we reduced driving by one mile per person by day? Well, we've done the math. And basically, we figured out, as I said earlier, it's about $30 billion. And as a result, the disgeneration, my son, my daughter, they're driving less, they're buying fueling cars, and they want to live in cities. And cities have become not the problem, but the solution. And the green dividend in Indianapolis, if you decrease the number of people who drive your cars in Indianapolis and its region by just one mile per day over the course of a year, you will save about $320 million in economic savings. And if you reduce poverty by 1%, about $330 million in Indianapolis. But the key, and this is why you're here today, is that none of this is done by one sector. It can't be done by the private sector or public sector or nonprofit sector or the philanthropic sector or even the citizen sector alone. But if you're at that intersection and you're working together collaborative for collective impact and not operating in the silos that so many cities do, you will win. And we believe that be, the reason Velocity is such a powerful plan, such a powerful framework, such a powerful vision is that you're all rowing in the same direction. Steve Jobs once said, the three most important things are to tear down walls, build bridges, and light fires. If you tear down the walls between the sectors and the generations and build bridges between them, if you treat emerging leaders not at the kids' table but at the adult table and treat them as your peers, and if you light fires, take chances, and focus on being a startup city, then you win, and you are a velocity city, Indianapolis. Thank you very much. Final thing I want to say is that the best area code in the country, without doubt, is 317. Right here. I'll be wearing this on the plane home today. Thank you.